We've been doing hybrid modeling for well over a decade now, um, have contributed a number of uh, uh, well-cited contributions in this area. Um, these include uh, models that are of um, that exploit hybrid modeling for different for different reasons, different goals. And I'm going to try to touch on uh, different goals for this. And what you'll see is that from hybrid model to hybrid model, well, they're all united by the uh, general feature that they weave together multiple types of dynamic modeling, multiple traditions. They differ quite a lot in how they use those traditions to advantage, okay? Um, now, for this um, lecture, for the first time, I'm going to uh, be making, res making use of interactively of some of these modeling types from the library of pattern of models I provided to you. So this presentation is going to go between slides on the one hand and direct hands-on use of any logic on the other. And some of those tips I just gave you I think may be useful. Okay. Um, so the opening reflection I want to I want to start with here. Um, uh, observes that system science mo uh, methodologies, if you really talk to people who genuinely put multiple methodologies into use and have a history of doing so, what you will find is a recognition that they're highly complementary. Um, it's not that one replaces another. Uh, it's not merely that they are um, uh, complementary. They, they have a degree of, of, uh, of uh, a mutual support in the right circumstances. And different methodologies fundamentally seek to answer different types of questions um, and, uh, and is used for different types of situations or needs. And no one system science methodology is going to offer a complete replacement for the other. And there are these compelling synergies from, from using them together, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so I want to talk about a few motivations for this uh, hybrid model. One, uh, one um, motivation is what I referred to earlier. It's comparative advantage. It's just easier to represent um, certain dynamics in a framework A compared to a framework B. So maybe you're, you know, you're interested in capturing dynamics over a network. And for that, neither discrete event simulation nor particularly system dynamics modeling it has the particular uh, formalisms or tools to to reify, to represent networks. And Asian-based modeling easily represents networks. And um, it's kind of the right tool for the job to, to characterize network structure. Yes, we can make use of mixing matrices. Yes, we can kind of post hoc try to have a mixing um, sort of binary mixing matrix of all, all individuals to all individuals in the system dynamics, but nature based modeling just makes it very, very crisp. Uh, similarly, um, you have uh, a, uh, a situation where you have resources and resource needs, and you're, you're wondering about placement of resources or levels of resources and how they affect delivery of, of, of services along some structured pathway. I mean, it's just fit for discrete event simulation. And it's, you'll save a lot of time by using that and free up time for inquiry, for, for asking questions and taking your model further. So one area is comparative advantage that we use. Another is there's different analysis needs um, uh, between different areas of the model. So, um, maybe there's different levels of interest. Maybe your model has a focal point on a certain population of, of focal interest, um, you know, with certain risk factors. But you have to represent the broader population to, to because they're linked to this focal population. Rather than representing them all at the same level, you know, using an agent-based model for everyone. And you're only interested in a small subset. Maybe you want to use a, an aggregate model for most of the population, and when they reach a certain point in the risk continuum, 
or the point of interest, you, you bud them off, you agentify them, you, you individuate them into agents. We'll see that as, as one of the exemplars of, of hybrid modeling. So here we have different priorities and levels of interest. Our attention is focused on certain areas and not others that we can do without detailed representation or, or simpler representation of heterogeneity in certain areas. And, and that allows us to, to make use of different representations. A third area that I alluded to is the capacity to evolve the boundary with, with learning. I had argued that models are learning tools, learning prostheses. They help us you know, more quickly understand when our, our cherished understanding of the system is off base, more quickly um, allow us to face the fact that, wait, our thinking is misguided in a certain area, um, and correct our cherished prejudices um, and to make them more in line with what, what the body of, of evidence from the world suggests. And here, modeling is learning, and modeling, uh, the modeling process, and really as part of its learning, it, it points out to you certain areas of the model which might be, a pr be important that you hadn't realized it. Maybe you conduct a sensitivity analysis, and you find it's highly sensitive to that assumption, for example. Or maybe you are doing, uh, putting in place scenarios, and you find really a lot of things um, that are most important are resource availability, and you really need to grapple with resources, you realize. This is part of the learning that goes on with models is we realize um, you know, which, uh, which areas of the system have to be represented in, in greater detail. Okay, so something exciting has just happened. So um, I am just going to uh, try to unexcite it. Um, and uh, uh, may I introduce you to a fine device? Um, <laughs> this is not about Sony. Um, uh, okay, so. Uh, another reason, uh, Jeff McDonald talks about this. I've learned so many things from uh, at Jeff's knee. Um, uh, one thing he said in his first visit to, to Saskatoon, um, uh, he, he commented um, on stakeholder resonance of models. Look, um, um, there were times where we have a need to address stakeholder confidence, buy-in, um, even sense of ownership in a central way. And it turns out that certain stakeholders relate better to certain modeling um, formalisms. So for example, um, uh, clinicians. Um, one comment Jeff had early on was that clinicians often articulate things that they're comfortable with things that articulate say patients as individuals and they can get starry-eyed or not quite the right word they can their eyes can glaze over if you show them you know an aggregate model which is stratified by patient characteristics and counts the number of patients with this characteristic because they're so used to dealing with encounters and, and individual patients with histories and so on and they're not used to dealing with it at, at, at that abstract level. It's not all clinicians. I've worked with clinicians with aggregate system dynamics models as well, but other clinicians have a real preference for seeing individuated patients who have histories and, and they can look at their, their characteristics uh, longitudinally, et cetera. And yet there's other times I've worked, say, with demographers and they prefer an aggregate stratified representation. So the point is, who you're working with, your clients, your stakeholders, the people that are supporting your project and whose buy-in and, um, and support is important to that project, can have a very material impact on your choice of modeling formalism. Um, and rather than just saying, we will use one modeling formalism and that's it, sometimes you want to have a hybrid model which for the areas that they're going to be dealing with, it's articulated at that level, but maybe the rest of it, you don't need to make the whole model again agent-based, you, you make other areas of it uh, that can afford the 
course of resolution, you know, a, an aggregate system on units model. And so the stakeholders are in familiar territory, they have buy-in, but they don't, they don't dictate the design of the whole model. It's kind of their part of it that interfaces with them. Um, greater computational efficiency. Um, um, refining uh, computational burden. It turns out that, that often we have limited time for a project and uh, opportunity costs are sometimes keenly felt. So if we spend a lot more time running, if it takes a lot more time to run model iteration, that's less time for learning. The learning cycle, how quickly we learn is slowed down. And so computational speed is not a small matter. We're gonna have a more advanced session in this boot camp on, on performance and on performance optimization, particularly with a note on hybrid modeling. Young Chen is gonna be an important, um, important stakeholder for that. Um, uh, but the point is, um, performance is, is, is important at a practical level for preserving time for learning, um, for helping us learn more effectively. It's, it's harder to do if we have to wait a day after running an experiment to see the results as it is if it's you know, two minutes or, or 30 seconds. And so sometimes we weave together techniques so that we have the requisite level of model performance we need to get the job done um, uh, and yet have the resolution we need on other areas. And finally, we have this multi-scale modeling that I allude to, and I've alluded to several times, which is we have dynamics at different levels of a system. So we have, um, let's say, physiologic dynamics associated with diabetes, and glucose and insulin dynamics at a prevailing level over time that ends up affecting clinical diagnosis uh, as a mediator for the effectiveness of interventions, ends up affecting um, being affected by weight and by pregnancy and, uh, and uh, decline of beta cell mass and function. Um, but that's tied up with clinical level concerns and the degree to which a patient will respond to clinical intervention as well as public health intervention. And, and now you've got these kind of levels of accounting at different levels that may not be amenable to easy summary. And uh, a growing number of our models tap into representation of effects at, uh, in, a, in a way that um, I like to call, and Jeff likes to call, but it's through the skin modeling. Meaning there's some things within a person, maybe it's immunological dynamics, maybe it's physiological dynamics associated with um, a body weight change and, and, and regulation. Maybe it's aspects of diabetes and, and, um, and organ systems. Um, but the idea is you have that, but you also have higher levels of, of, of uh, of um, dynamics as well. And you have an entangling between them that makes it very difficult to, to just say, we will summarize the lower level in an adequate way because maybe the success of the upper level depends on details of lower level evolution and, and uh, vice versa. So um, multi-scale modeling is something you will see quite a lot of. Um, we have some publications in the area that go back uh, over a decade and that are thought-provoking on, um, on the need to, to undertake this um, at an immunoepidemiological level and more recent uh, work on a number of chronic disease areas that we will see. So having, having talked about some of these motivations for hybrid modeling, you know, why weave together multiple traditions? I've just listed some. Um, responsive to that, I would like to list, um, would like to advance to you, submit to you five different patterns for performing this hybrid model. Okay. Five common different ways we've turned to again and again as useful, useful patterns for capturing in our models to make them responsive to some of those needs I've just enumerated. These are not silver bullets. There are many hybrid modeling patterns that do not fall neatly into any one of these. But we have found these very recurrently useful. 
and that they, they, they support duplication in many contexts that differ in their details. But mutatis mutandis, they carry, they share certain, um, certain essential elements. So um, I'll be going through these, and uh, with your leave, I will call up some models that will illustrate these. So the first of these is what well, I will term, for lack of a, of a more literate characterization, service population interaction. Um, this involves health impacts of some catchment population, uh, which is represented at an individual level with resource constrained services. And when I used a few of those words there, you should have immediately started to think, okay, a catchment population at an individual level, populations in the wild, as they say in areas of computer science, uh, at an individual level, that sounds like agent-based model. Um, resource constrained services, that sounds like discrete event simulation. And indeed, those are the two methods that that come together there. Now, I'd like to invite you to, um, to see some of this. And to do this, we will switch over to any logic and we will go get them all. Okay? That, that illustrates this. So I'm going to go over to any logic, but um, first I'm going to do file and I'm going to say close all. Um, you can always uh, get, it, get it back by opening recent models. I just want to avoid confusion by closing up that earlier model so we don't burden ourselves with, uh, with multiple models and engage in fruitless flailing. Okay? Um, okay. Next, we're going to need to go get this model. Um, one might be tempted to get it, but it's not going to be in get. Um, we're going to get it from the from the, okay, none of my students seem to get that. Um, maybe Narch has got that. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to the um, participant resources. Um, we're gonna go to example models, and we're gonna go into, once again, any logic eight examples. We are going to go for all of these to a uh, subfolder called hybrid models, okay? And what you will see before you is hybrid vigor. I guess people, maybe there's no biologists in the room. Um, uh, so here we go into hybrid models, okay? Um, and uh, within hybrid models, we have a wide variety of, of different hybrid types. I'd like you to, op I'd like you to navigate into one that's called multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. Um, okay, so I know it's a mouthful. Um, how did I get here? I went to the, the main um, participant resources folder. I went to example models, then I went to any logic eight examples. That presented me with a whole whack of models, or SWAC, I think is the technical term. And then I went down to uh, something called um, hybrid models, um, and I went in here, and, and that's um, um, once I've gone here. Um, and uh, there's a, uh, a, an, a one called multi-climate SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. If you click on that and you right-click, then you can do download on this ALP file, and it will bring it down to you. It'll bring it. It'll bring it down um, uh, to be subject to your bidding. Okay. Um, so TAs, please deploy to ensure that participants um, can secure this onto their machines in a timely fashion. Who needs help? Who needs TA help? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we've just downloaded it. I would like to go to any logic. Who needs a bit more time? A bit more time? Okay, it's, it's downloading. Okay, it sounds like you folks are encumbered, uh, you know, by a network that um, lacks the 
the tests of of of, of um, uh, this here, and I'm. I think we'll look into that. Maybe one of the TAs could look into. Yes, yes, is always slow. Even, but even for these computers. No, the lab ones are wired in. They should be fast. Yeah, yeah but they're they're, they're 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 getting really slow, and this one was slow, right? I think because it might be set up a new profile every time you log into a new machine, it has to reset all okay. profiles. Okay. Okay. In this case, it's downloading. That shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah that, that's. Maybe could could be could okay maybe maybe you could look into that just a bit to see if you could reproduce it and then show it to the powers that be um okay so uh, does is, is everyone ready okay um if you could do file open and then we will go open it from our downloads folder so TAs stand ready ever vigilant okay Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I've just opened this model. Okay. It's um, uh, and it should appear in its fulsomeness on the left-hand side here. And once again, you will recognize that this model has many pieces. Um, if we click on person, we'll see that people are in one of three states, susceptible, exposed, infective, and symptomatic. But they, they enjoy, if you, if you look here, um, and by the terms I described previously, um, this transition is a transition that is, um, and I'm not sure why this is so, hey, get back there. Um, Okay, uh, this is a transition that's treatment mediated. Individuals only recover in this model having been infected uh, and received, uh, getting to this infected point, they only recover in a treatment mediated fashion. They require treatment to recover, okay? Um, that's one state chart. The other state chart uh, has them in one of three states. They're not seeking care, they're in transit to care, or they're under care. We're not going to build this model right now, but, but I want you to understand that it depicts care seeking on the one hand and it depicts transmission of infection on the other. And you will find that um, if you go up a little bit, individuals are connected to other people via connections. Okay? Um, so if we go and um, we run this model, um, uh, we're going to um, run a single clinic high illness hazard. That's the sort of the second uh, experiment there. Okay, and what you will see is um, a uh, a depiction here of individuals uh, uh, located uh, in in homes and. Individuals are colored by their infection status, and over time, individuals are becoming infected, um, and they are presenting for care at, at a single clinic, which which has an entropic, uh, distressingly entropic um, uh, appearance, um, and we see a distressing phenomenon noted um, in the form of uh, uh, adversely high levels of uh, prevalence um, and uh, here we have I believe um, I'm gonna have to uh, check this uh, check this out this illness count here we can go and actually look I'm gonna double click on main I'm, I'm trying to remember uh, I think the two the two top graphs one may be incidents one may be um, uh, yes yeah, so this is prevalent case count at the bottom and the other is, ah, healthcare worker utilization, okay? Um, and this top one is actually an illustration of, uh, I think, the number of times that someone has been infected. Yeah, count of times they've been ill. So we see a population um, that is uh, distressingly high burden in terms of its infection. 
the um, the illness count here is uh, so the prevalence of infection is uh, very high. It's about 1,100 right now, in a total population here of 1,200. So we have um, you know just about eight percent of the population. So one twelfth of the, the population that's not infected at any any percent. So it's like ninety two percent prevalence. Uh, we have healthcare utilization, uh, the utilization of workers of of uh, clinic workers is upwards of ninety percent now. And we have many individuals who've been infected many times in the course of their of their health trajectory. Um, so we're seeing not just burden widely across the population, but recurrently as people get reinfected. They are thrown back into the networks whence they come, and they are getting reinfected quickly. They are lent a cure, but are, are, um, are getting reinfected. Now, if you're wondering how they're lent to cure, if you double click on clinic, what you will find is there's actually a depiction of a clinic here to which they present, okay? So they present to a clinic here and, and they await treatment. If the clinic keeps them waiting too long, they will consider leaving without being seen or balking in more um, uh, coarse terminology. Um, but at some point, if they wait long enough, they enjoy enough persistence, they'll get treated, and there's a chance of treatment failure or successful treatment um, according to this. I don't know if you recognize this language here, but this is another visual depiction of discrete event simulation. And in fact, if you were to drill down into this model through this <coughs> panel, and you were to, to go here and look at clinics, you will find this clinic. And you will define, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a distressing phenomenon whereby um, of the individuals who have been treated thus far, who are somewhere upwards of approaching 1.5 million, uh, of those only about 50,000 have gone on to treatment. The remaining group uh, have, uh, which is the vast majority, have ended up leaving without being seen because of the long waits involved. Um, most individuals who are treated are treated successfully. Uh, a small number are not treated successfully. So here we have a resource constrained system. And ladies and gentlemen, we can see here as, as is enabled for us by, um, by discrete event simulation, a depiction of level of workload or love of utilization of a resource. In this case, the key resource is none other than um, healthcare worker availability. And we see that that's upwards of 96% in use. So these workers are stretched to the max. This type of modeling is extremely, makes it extremely easy, for example, to delineate clinic hours. To say this clinic is only open these hours, or it has this many staff on on, on, on call you know, during these hours and this other number at this hour. We can easily modify assumptions about that um, number of healthcare workers. And in fact, live uh, here, we can, we can look in for some, some additional information about this. I won't, I won't go into this, but uh, we, can, we can find out um, additional, additional information about what's going on. We can also add a healthcare worker. So let's add, perhaps we'll add in, ah, okay. Now notice what's happening. I added a, 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 a 15 healthcare workers. I brought it up to 16. Can anyone note what's happening here? Have I helped the situation? Yes. yes. I succeeded in lowering the utilization uh, very significantly. It's now down to about uh, 13%, 12%, and improving rapidly. I'm going to go up to this level, and we see an entirely different picture, don't we, of, of the epidemiology in the population. Ladies and gentlemen, how could this be? How could adding a healthcare worker in this 
healthcare utilization side affect the epidemiology of the population? Can anyone posit an idea? Yeah, this is, this is a model, it's a hybrid model. They're tangled together in the model, just as they are in the world, right? Um, all too often, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the folks who are doing healthcare service delivery research are a world apart from those doing population health research. All too often, they're solitudes or, or have little interaction. But um, the truth is that the two are entwined in terms of the generative pathways. And in the model, reflecting that, we have, just as was said, uh, we have in the clinic a pathway which leads to treatment, and conferring that treatment on individuals means if you successfully treat that person, um, that would prevent them from spreading the infection of the population, right? Now, what does that have to do with healthcare resource utilization? Well, and, and you know, availability of healthcare workers. Remember, when we had too few healthcare workers, what was happening? They weren't getting treated. Why weren't they getting treated? Because they were waiting too long and they, they left. And guess what? They went back to their transmission networks, whether needle-borne or, or sexual or, or you know, uh, uh, fecal oral or what have you. We, we're not getting into that issue. But um, the point is that that led to population health consequences in terms of very high levels of, of prevalence in the, in the population. So if we were to go, again, up a level here from the clinic and we were to go look at what's happened, what we find is a, you know, a real decline. And in fact, do you see what lies before us? What, what has happened in the past few seconds, even as I was speaking to you? What has happened? The dream of centuries. The infection. the infection died out. There was pathogen extinction um, in a way that, that Sophie would appreciate. Um, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that was achieved by healthcare service utilization because we are capturing this tangling. Where's the other side of the tangling? We saw how the, the healthcare service delivery here um, by the way, I'm going to start this again for pedagogic reasons, um, uh, and and we'll we'll get it running again. We'll see the very high levels of utilization, and I'll do this a little bit more closely. But we saw one one corner of it, didn't we? We saw how healthcare utilization um, uh, successfully ends up uh, leading to uh, ends up leading to people balking. If there's too few healthcare resources available, people balk, they leave, they go back to their transmission networks and they transmit. We saw that side. How does the population health side impact what's going on in the clinic? Well, it's quite simple. If we go to the level of the population, you may remember here that each population member um, can be infected. And if they're, if they're infective and symptomatic, they will often seek care after a certain amount of time. So they'll go to the clinic. So, um, the I'm here to provide care and new coffee, new teas, and cookies, and such. That, thank you, thank you, Christine. No yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so, so in short, these two are tangled. Uh, uh, spreading the, in the population health level, the spread of the infection leads to presentation. And if it's very high prevalence levels or very high incidence levels, you get, you know, thereby your prevalence leading to incidence, and, and incidence leads to, to presentation for care, and that can overload the, the healthcare uh, delivery side, which can lead to people balking, et cetera. Let's go back to the clinic. Here we're gonna go back to the clinic. Let's, let's go visit our clinic again. Whoa, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go down to that. Here we go. Um, we're in an adverse situation. Here's the clinic. Um, and let's go see what's going on here. I'm going to add a healthcare worker. I'm going to go from one to two. How much does that help? Anyone? Not much. Not much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, let's add another one. Okay. Um, okay, now what did, I, what did I do to... Hey, 
Uh, there we are. Three. How much did that help? Not very much. I'm going to add a four. You know, four now. Not very much. Five. Let's go see what's going on at the population level. Surely, ah, ah, okay. So, so now we got a precipitous decline. Let's let's try this again. Um, let's let's just explore this uh, from a from a standpoint of the epidemiology. Here we have very high levels. I'm going to go back to that clinic, and I'm going to I'm going to add in two more people. There we are. Total of three. Surely I've, I've greatly helped the situation. I've, I've multiplied by three the number of people there. What are we seeing? Well, we're still seeing quite a high level of, of prevalence, aren't we? Um, and uh, we haven't broken it. In fact, the healthcare utilization is still going up. Or sorry, the, the, the resource utilization is still rising. That means ever rising number of people waiting and so on. And we still have a distressingly high number of people infected. It's just once we get to this, uh, I'll do four now. Okay, here we go, four. Let's go up and, and look here. Um, there we go. Um, we're still at 700, still a very high level of, of prevalence in the population. Um, uh, and we have essentially constantly busy, constantly busy. We're having people reinfected like gangbusters. But you go to five, ladies. Whoop, you go, you go to, you go to five uh, healthcare workers. Let's go back down there. Um, and uh, there we go. Add a healthcare worker, and now the, it's a game changer. This is what we call a tipping point, right? It's 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 tipped it over the edge. Why? Because of resource availability. This sort of model is very well suited to look at that way between population health and resource availability when it comes to service delivery. This tangled, this tangling of those pathways uh, on the, the service delivery side and the population health side uh, are, are crisply and elegantly represented on um, each by using um, each of these two methods to their greatest advantage. Okay, so um, so this is one compelling hybrid modeling pattern, ladies and gentlemen. Um, any questions uh, related to this pattern uh, before we we uh, go on to uh, to others? I would note that if you're interested in this. Um, we have um, a paper, actually a set of papers now, there have been some others which have come off uh, most recently in nephrology journals um, that articulate this, you know, there's, a, there's this capacity to neatly capture resource-based constraint processes and, and capacity to capture these interactions in the population um, to, to represent networks or spatial locations, geographic locations of people in the population. And uh, I provided you, um, I believe, uh, s some other models that, uh, that illustrate this. Um, uh, okay. Um, there's food outside, and I'd like to allow people to get that, and we'll continue our discussion here. But any questions about that particular one before we move on to the next pattern? Yeah. What we just saw yeah. was, a, was a hybrid um, agent-based model and a discrete Great question. Great question. I'll I, I, thank you very much for that, and um, I'll characterize that. So if we go look at this, um, uh, there's uh, there's two sort of broad areas where each uh, are captured, and and for ease of sort of showing this, I'll separate this. The agent-based characterization was uh, placing individuals in a, uh, a context, a, a space here. It could have been geographic, although I did this one um, in a more stylized sort of uh, region. Um, you know, so we have individuals associated with a home, for example, um, and we have them pro progressing. They're associated with networks. These networks are, uh, 
and, and I'll, I'll just double check this, but my recollection is that these networks are articulated in a way that is uh, distanced based, meaning they are, um, uh, they are uh, connected with uh, other individuals who are uh, nearby in space, okay? Um, and uh, moreover, um, uh, we have individuals who are, who are placed in uh, the context of these homes and they go through these two state charts. Um, so we have individuals who go through a susceptible, exposed, and infective stages, um, where uh, those progressions uh, might in general be set by things like their sex and their income or what have you, by aspects of their heterogeneity. But um, these uh, elements of progression include some components that are based on interactions with others. So this link here, susceptible to exposed, you notice it's associated with this little envelope thing. That indicates, again, that something else in the model is telling this person, you are exposed. And what you'll find is that individuals here, it's actually in this little transition here, are infecting each other, okay? So whilst that they are infective and symptomatic, they're sending messages to individuals with whom they're connected via this connection up there. Now, um, uh, this connection between individuals, like I infect you, is very uncharacteristic in discrete event simulation. Discrete event simulation, I affect you and you affect me, but it's pretty much in one way, that I keep you waiting, or you keep me waiting for a resource, and resource availability. Here we have a much more flexible form of interaction. Here it involves transmission of pathogen, but more generally it could involve transmission of norms or attitudes, beliefs, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, risk factors. Um, and so this is making use of the agent-based um, uh, agent context in a big way. This movement of agents to certain physical locations that may be located at different distances can also be done in a very agent-based way. This, this is agent-based, but it could take advantage more of it if, for example, um, an individual's presentation for care was more likely if they're near a facility and less likely if it's further away. You know, perhaps, for example, an individual um, uh, might be less likely to seek, uh, uh, seek uh, care and treatment or uh, if they are uh, located at a long distance from a facility. And that would be very easy to do with their home location. They're bound to a, a specific home location and they have to go to a clinic which is located at a certain location or a, a one of a set of clinics. So it would be very easy to, to, to add this to it even though it doesn't include it now. Right now it does find the nearest clinic and they present for that. So this aspect of location in location situation, you know, situated in space and especially if we're making decisions based on that, much as that first model we saw was um, with a grocery store, a convenience store. And here in this interaction between agents, those are like classic agent-based formulations. By contrast, this formulation up here in the clinic where we have a, um, a, a workflow and uh, entities here, patients, flow through this, um, this workflow and they are processed or kept waiting based on availability of resources, like the availability of healthcare resources here. Um, uh, and, you know, treatment is conferred um, correctly or incorrectly according to a certain probability specified, uh, specified here by probability of treatment success. That is all dictated uh, by a discrete event model, okay? Um, so networks, um, uh, uh, situated uh, decision-making, interaction interactions uh, via mechanisms, these are classic agent-based uh, immobility of agents in geographic or, or quasi-geographic space. Um, representation of structured workflows that are resource-limited, 
that we monitor our resources, we can add and, and change resources, we can monitor uh, utilization levels uh, very easily. Um, it would especially be, we can easily add in this, in this language a way of timing, how long do people spend before being seen and so on. Those are all discrete event simulation um, uh, sort of specialties. And this could be done in agent-based modeling, like we could represent this, um, uh, but it would require a level of uh, implementation sophistication that would leave itself open to bugs and would have an opportunity cost. You know, putting the time into capturing this in an agent-based model as, as only using agent-based reasoning would involve writing code associated with resources and putting resource available and you have that resource, I don't, so I'm kept waiting. It would involve reinventing the wheel. Really, this is just perfect fit, perfect fit for discrete event simulation. Um, and if we wanted to, we could look at resource availability, or resource you know, uh, location and its effect, et cetera. So um, I don't know if that's helpful, but I've tried to articulate where each begins and each ends. And the key point here is that each affects the other. So presentation for care by agents, they come in this walk-in pathway, okay? So if you go look at the agent level here, if you go look at agent, um, and you'll notice them arriving at care here, um, they actually go and they're taken in as a walk-in appointment. They're taken into the clinic. This is like where it, they go in. They're still in this state chart, but they also go into the clinic at this point. It's like. You know, they presented for care. They're under care now from the standpoint of this state chart, but they are in the clinic as far as that workflow is concerned. And then um, they, they enjoy a completion of care and a recovery here from their affliction um, here in the clinic when they uh, undergo a successful treatment. Um, so uh, let me see, here we are. Um, so there's a probability of treatment success and, okay, a successful treatment. Um, this is uh, interesting. There's actions on the decision. Uh, there's an action on the decision. That's where I captured it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good man. Good man. Um, here it is. So uh, here, if they, if, if the treatment is successful, we flip a coin according to this probability, probability of treatment success. If it is successful, we cure them. We say, thou art cured. And, and that leads them in the agent side back here to, to go, and this is this cured message, cured. If I am cured, I go back to a susceptible state. Um, uh, and uh, if, they're, if they don't receive that, they remain afflicted, even though when they, um, when they leave the clinic, they, if, either via bulking or via um, uh, going through this, they depart the clinic, and departing the clinic brings them back, cured or not, to this uh, completion of, the, of uh, to, to this uh, state where they're not seeking care right now. So they may think they're cured because they've been given, you know, um, the treatment. They've been given uh, antibiotics, but there was a primary treatment failure and they ended, up, um, they ended up leaving the clinic thinking that they were now free of infection and potentially engaging in risk behavior, but they're back back here and not seeking care, even though they remain afflicted. And after a certain amount of time, they'll realize that and represent for care. And so they'll circulate, potentially, you know, with frequent flyers, or we're not supposed to say that. We're supposed to call them friendly faces now. Um, so they'll be a, a friendly face to represent. <laughs> they might not be, they might be increasingly less friendly if, if they're subject to increasing, you know, treatment failures. Um, uh, Okay, so um, any, uh, so great question. Other questions? Other questions? Okay, let's get, get some refreshments and uh, we'll continue on to another type of hybrid modeling, which is um, uh, compelling, um, which will focus on a zoomed in view of a focal population of interest 
while keeping a coarser view of the rest of the population. So we use our, our powerful lens for that area of the sky we're interested in, but we get that broader view of the rest of the, the picture with a, a coarser tool that still allows us to capture some dynamics. So we'll come back to that um, in about 10 minutes uh, as we, uh, after we've enjoyed the food and after I've eaten the rest of my lunch. Thank you. So um, within the last little bit, uh, we had looked at uh, interaction between uh, uh, population uh, perspective and, and health service delivery uh, perspective. Um, we're now going to take a look at a model which um, provides a different use of hybrid modeling and specifically one that um, uh, has a focal population and uh, and then agents uh, flowing into it. The model that I'm going to show, I'm going to spend less time on because I'm conscious of the time here, um, but um, uh, it, it illustrates the principle. Uh, and it goes by a somewhat funny name. So if we go back to any logic, I'd like you to close this model. So if you do file and you do close all, um, uh, and you can say, uh, do you want to save it? No, if asked, okay? Um, next, um, you can do, uh, we should go to our browser and we'll go again to the hybrid models area. So that's just one level up. If you were still in that area that we saw earlier, um, all you have to do is, is uh, go click here on hybrid models. Um, and there's one called the budding hybrid SD ABM model. Um, and if you double click on that, you will, um, you will find yourself in another folder where you will see a, an AnyLogic uh, file, okay? Um, and if you right click on this file, again, this is under hybrid models, budding hybrid SDABL. So uh, TAs, please help the participants here, right? So if you click on that, you should be able to do download. And uh, you should be able to, to get that, um, uh, get that uh, onto your machine in that way. I'll give you uh, a moment uh, to do that. Okay. So where did I go? Is it still in hybrid models? That was under the AnyLogic 8 examples hybrid. We were, we were in there before. It's the budding hybrid model. Okay. And you should right click on it and do download. So it, it downloads to your machine. And then within any logic, you should do file open and open budding hybrid model, okay? Okay. Now, this model by itself looks puzzling. What you see is two stocks and a flow between them. I didn't forget. Um, I didn't forget. I have yeah. a question, Nate. Does the position of the stuff in the box matter? Uh, uh, yeah, so great question. Um, so uh, yes and no, okay? So the location of the vast majority of these items is immaterial. It doesn't matter um, uh, in terms of any function. But there is one exception, okay? And that exception has to do with the visual element. So, if, so this circle. The reason there's a circle there is because, uh, as it turns out, um, uh, persons will be represented in this model. Agents, individual agents, will be represented as a, as a circle. So if you double click on person here, you'll see that they're lent this shape. Their face upon the world is a circle, okay? Now, the fact that that is at that 
sort of what looks like the origin or something where those two lines, almost axes, um, cross. The fact that that's located there is significant. What it means is that the agents will be appearing on the screen at their logical position, meaning each agent is associated with a logical position in X and Y space here. And the fact that this is right here, um, you know, bang on that origin means this circle will appear right on top of their logical location. If it were, let's suppose, um, uh, located over here, don't do this, and especially don't do it at home, but if it were over here, um, uh, or say here, they'd be located, well, if you, if you go look down at the bottom of the screen, it says um, uh, the, the, the X coordinate of this is, is 50, is 50, um, so they'd, be, they'd appear 50 units to the right of their actual logical location. And, um, you know, it, if everything was varying 50 to the units right in their location, it wouldn't matter that much. But if you get inconsistencies, like this one is the left of its location, this one is the right, it can get really confusing. So, in general, if you are positioning sort of pictures or, or shapes or anything that's going to depict what that thing looks like when you run the model, it should be placed at this origin, okay? And I take care to do so. Um, and you'll notice that uh, in my models, things were in different places for different models, but one constant between them is that uh, those items, uh, I'm very careful about aligning it um, with that position. In name, what, where these things are on the canvas actually also matters, okay? So it matters in the sense of when you get that window showing you, is it visible will depend on, you know, is it kind of in this region. If it's over here, you won't see it initially unless you scroll. And so it doesn't matter for model logic or operation. It's not like the model will run differently. It's just for the user, it may be confusing because they won't see what they wanted to see. They won't even know there's a graph there unless they scroll up. And, you know, in general with models, like these that are visual, screen real estate is pretty important. And, and I have to say, this is one of the areas where I think I have personal failings because I'm, I'm not as consistent as I need to be about screen real estate. There's others in the room um, uh, that are, are actually quite, some of my TAs here are quite careful about where they lay things out. And they have certain patterns or rules that they use, you know, like always put, um, always put uh, parameters off to the left of the main area in main so you don't see them initially but you can easily get to them and you know certain things go on the screen certain things don't um just like coloration layout can be valuable to, to really think about when you're particularly if you're using it to show to stakeholders who you want to you know, to very clearly zero into the gist of it. Again, it's not a matter of how the model runs there, it's a matter of uh, uh, user experience and kind of uh, comfort with, with understanding the model. But um, uh, this, this location thing can be confusing enough. It actually does change to, to a degree model, experience, uh, model uh, operation design. Like if you, if you um, there can be times where it, it, uh, it changes the meaning of, of interactions in a certain way. When you click on the location, you have to click to the right of, of something. Anyway, I, I suggest just being careful putting it where it's, it's at the crosshairs. But other than that, um, it doesn't matter so much is, is what I'd say. Wade, uh, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that's essentially true. It, if you're trying to craft a certain user experience for a model that will be used by stakeholders, then you want to pay more attention to where you place things and putting in things like buttons to navigate uh, yeah. from, from view to view and things like that. But it, it depends on the end use case for the model. And uh, I would highlight um, way to someone who's worked with some larger models, you'll be seeing some of them. But uh, some of them allow for uh, navigation very 
in very uh, easy ways to different regions of the model, and it's to his credit that you see that. Okay. Okay. So um, we're uh, we're moving along here. Um, uh, so, so this budding hybrid model, you may be wondering what it's about because it seems so simple. It's just a stock and flow model. Um, by the way, this, this, um, uh, this sort of depiction here is a result of having a population of these people. This sort of gets placed there for reasons um, that, <laughs> that are a little bit obscure, but um, uh, time-wise you could use it to set the which one appeared in front and so on. And um, uh, in any case, what, what, what's going to happen here is we're going to have a non-diabetic population. Imagine that we want to focus on a population with diabetes. Okay? Our focus is on individuals with diabetes. There are a subset of the entire population. Um, uh, but we want to represent non-diabetics, those with normal glycemia, say, um, uh, as well. We want to represent a population perhaps at risk um, uh, and a population you know, of low risk people as well as they progress. Um, so here, we're going to use the stock and flow, a high level aggregate stock and flow model. But we're going to have a process by which people develop diabetes according to their characteristics. And once they become diabetic, we will individuate them. We will turn them into individuals. We will lend them a face upon the world as an individual. And we will follow them in detail in their, one could, it's not shown here, but one could say their you know, episodes of care and their, the treatments that they've been delivered and uh, their particulars and their individual history in a way we couldn't at an aggregate level. So here, we will have this uh, population and we will run it and what you will see is that over time people transition and having transitioned um, from here to here they will actually be created as agents okay so this is this probably seems you know bizarrely um, like a piece of, of abstract art um, but the point is People are leaving the diabetic state, and as they develop diabetes, according to this hazard rate, mean time, it's actually one over mean time to develop diabetes is the hazard rate. This is the mean time. As they flow to here, they actually don't go in the stock for any persistent times. So instead, they're created as an individual with certain characteristics. And the idea here is that you can use a model like this to represent a broader population. This could be stock after stock over stock. We could have, you know, a whole articulated system dynamics model out there, subscripted by age and age group and sex, and, um, uh, you know, we could have um, uh, different levels of obesity or what have you for the general population. But once people become diabetic, they are followed as individuals. So what happens here is that people get created as individuals as they flow in. And I won't bore you with all the details, although I'll be happy to talk about it uh, later, but basically there's this create agent trigger. And what happens is we go through and as people need, sort of end up flowing in there, they get turned into an agent. <laughs> they, they get added to the population of an agent and, and basically we take them out of this stock and we add them as an agent to the population. Okay, so the idea is very simple. It's, you can have a model with an upstream population that you don't want to simulate at an individual level. It's way overkill. You don't need that level of resolution at an individual level to capture networks and longitudinal progression and geographic location and episodes of care. But once they reach a certain focal level of risk, that's when we turn them into agents. This is the most stylized of depictions of it but it gets to the essence of how you do it at a mechanical level, how you create agents once they flow down a little uh, flow and you, you make them into a full agent and having so done, um, in so doing, now you have an agent population that over time is growing. And in fact, here we have uh, a population of, of, of agents uh, of, of, uh, of note. And in fact, if we were to go up a level here, 
you'll find there's a population of 55 agents. Not surprisingly, that plus this is equal to the original population. And as we run this model further, here we go. As people come out of here, this population swells, okay? It's, it's up to 71, which not surprisingly, plus this is going to equal the total population, uh, much lower, a tiny thing here. Um, and so this is a, a different type of hybrid model. It's a hybrid model that supports coarse grained representation in one area, fine grained representation in another. I apologize it's so stylized, but it, it really cuts the essence of what needs to be um, what needs to be represented. And the more people that come in, the more creative. There's a model like this that um, I believe was created for Australian collaborators involving EDs. And that model was also had a flow out of this uh, agent population when people became of low risk again. And they actually turned into a stock. So they flowed into a stock. They lost their individuality and they became a number um, in the stock. You know, they were just one person in a stock of, you know, females 50 to 54 years old, you know, uh, in this income decile. Um, and, and that's how they were captured. So we only captured individuals in a certain portion of the system, and outside of that, it was aggregate. So that was a different variant of this. So that's a second, uh, another hybrid modeling pattern. Why would you do this? Well, I have some slides on that. Um, uh, the idea is, look, um, you have tighter focus for your detailed ABM assumptions. You focus your ABM representation on a certain target <coughs> population of concern. Um, it's lighter weight simulation because the vast majority of the population is aggregate representation. Um, and it's faster experimentation because you can run an aggregate model very quickly and you have a much smaller agent based model. Um, and we actually do have a model like this that's much more articulate if anyone wants to see it. And I'll be presenting on it likely later this week as a case study. It's diabetes and end stage renal disease. And the idea is that once people reach a certain point and they're continuing them to risk, they get turned into a, an agent and followed as a diabetic agent, including through their end-stage renal disease trajectories, their trans recipient of a transplant, um, uh, received a graft failure, uh, dialysis modalities, et cetera. So there, the broader population is a feeder to our population. We want to know about it as far as rates of becoming diabetic or, or risk factors like obesity um, might plausibly be in there, but, um, but really we, we, all the agents are those with diabetes and uh, diabetic end stage renal disease being a particular point of interest. Okay, so this is a, a, a second compelling hybrid modeling pattern and we have individuated population that has, that has progressed from a lower risk population. Any questions involving that? Yeah? I just have a, have a specific question. I was interested in the numbers in the other when it was running. And, yeah. And, um, so I understand you have that hazard rate, but then what were, what were, the, what were those numbers that were, we were seeing in terms of how many people would get turned into Oh, what, what yeah. Kind of yeah. So, like, like, um, what, what, what sure. So, like, like these ones here. Oh, oh, this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so what happens? This is a bit of. Um, let me let me just clear this so you can uh, see it with greater clarity. I'll I'll start it again and then I'll I'll pause it. Um, right. So, like, what is what is this? This is a bit of a um, mechanism of how it gets created. And um, if there were interest, I could actually build this with you in, in probably an hour. But um, the basic deal is here. We need a way of, of, of turning individuals who are becoming diabetic into agents. That, that's the gist of it. And any logic doesn't provide a built-in way of doing this, OK? It doesn't 
allow us to simply hitch this hose out here, this kind of, this, this pipe, this, um, th this outflow. It doesn't allow us to just say, you know, spawn agents as people flow through here. So we need a way to, to kind of engineer that into the system. And so what happens here, um, and again, forgive me for, for talking the plumbing, but this is a bit of the plumbing, um, almost in a literal sense, is um, we have this thing called create agent trigger, okay? And what happens is people come down here, and one thing you've got to realize about system dynamics models, um, that's very, very material here is, um, in system dynamics models, um, you can routinely be dealing with stocks that are arbitrarily low. So for example, we have a paper on some of the distortions caused by when you have a model of antibiotic resistance, um, um, you know, a, a system dynamics model of that can, can yield weird results when you have something like, you know, one thousandth of a person with antibiotic resistance still leading to persistence of antibiotic resistance in the population. So a system dynamics model is not, is not quantized by actual people. You can have like 989.167 people here, okay? And, and rates of flow can be very small. So, so you might have, you know, one, one person per month getting diagnosed with diabetes or one person per day or what have your, your, your units here. Um, and so this flow comes down here in a gradual fashion. It's people per unit time, right? And it takes a certain amount of time before you accumulate enough people to, to be one agent to be created. It's like you might have, you know, in the first half day, point, you know, 0.5 agents, and the second half day, 0.25 agents. You haven't gotten a full person who needs a place in the world. Um, once it reaches one full person coming down here, then we actually go and we create that person. It's kind of like, um, you know, this is less of an issue if you have millions of people and, you know, you have tens of thousands of agents getting diabetes every month and you just create every month, you know, uh, uh, the requisite number of people. But what happens is this model is looking for one full person going down here and it may have to wait a bit of time. And then when it finds one full person, it creates them. And then it takes, it decrements it from this because it's already created them. It doesn't have to create them again, but there may be some leftovers. You know, it's like maybe 1.25 people have come down here and it creates one full person. There's 0.25 people left to be created. And this is the way system dynamics is kind of, um, and, and this is something that's a little bit odd about it, is um, you can have partial, you know, a stock of 0.5 people infected or something like that. And when it comes to mixing with agents, which are all about particular numbers of people, you have one person, or you have zero, or you have two, or you have three. There's no like 0.25 people to be created. And so that's why there's this kind of odd mechanism here that you gotta wait till there's a full person to be created, and then you create them. And and then if there's any leftovers, you know, you gotta wait until it's a full person again, and then you create them. And and that's what this kind of thing is about. So this agent creation trigger. I hope my students are watching this because it's uh, there, there's some things you can learn even now from your from your from the old man. Um, uh, so so see if it says diabetics to be created as agents if it's greater than one. Okay, it's like time to make the donuts. You know, it's it's time to time to build the agent because we got we've got one person that's flowed down to diabetic state. I don't, it doesn't keep track of how long that took. Maybe it took two days for them to get a full agent, but now that we have a full agent that needs to be created, we will create that agent, but we won't create an agent if we don't have that full agent yet. We'll only create as many as we have. Um, so that's, that's a bit what this code is doing. And it's, it's awkward because system dynamics meshing, this is one area where system dynamics and agent-based modeling that they have different lenses, and system dynamics doesn't care about whether it's partial people. 
you know, it, it readily and happily says that 0.01 people with diabetes now. But from an Asian-based perspective, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Either there's zero or there's one or there's two, and that's why it has to wait until there's enough for at least one per full person, and then it will create however many full people are represented here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I apologize, it's just, um, that's one of these kind of impedance mismatches, as we call it in engineering, between the two things. You get, um, you get in cis dynamics many cases where you might have partial people, and agent-based modeling says, nah, I need a full person, thank you very much. You know, I need to give them characteristics, right? I need to give them certain features. So that's what that's all about. Great question. Other questions? Okay, let's move on to the third type of, uh, of modeling, uh, of, uh, of demonstration, if we could. Um, so here we go. Um, okay, this, this is a very common one, and it's one at the heart of a lot of the models you will see this week. Um, or several of those models. System dynamics driven agent evolution. So here you have system dynamics within agents for continuous health uh, dynamics, okay? So the idea here is that each agent has within it, hence the magnifying glass, if you look closely at the agent, you will see, you will see stocks and flows within it, representing its immune systems evolution over time, immune memory as it builds up due to exposure to pathogen and decays. Or maybe these are stocks and flows opposed to with stress levels. Or maybe they're stocks and flows associated with tolerance levels to some, um, uh, to some uh, drug, right, to, to opioids. Um, so I build up tolerance, or maybe to nicotine, right? I build up tolerance, and uh, what that means is to get the same fix, I need more of that dose, and this would remember my tolerance level. Or maybe it's a level of substance in my body, or maybe at any one time, or maybe it's my level of stress based on my, my psychosocial stress levels, based on those around me. Um, maybe, it's, um, maybe it's my weight and my, my uh, concerns about my weight, um, uh, or my, my, my feelings of, um, of um, inadequacy during, because of weight. So the point is, there's many cases where we have agents who might plausibly have continuous dynamics that need to be described. And it turns out system dynamics, or, or compartmental and ODE models in general, are exquisite tools for capturing theory based on, on the continuous dynamics of feedback-based systems. And as I mentioned, the physiologic models of Guyton and others, um, uh, Chin Yang has used De Gaetano's models in her model of diabetes and pregnancy to great effect. And, um, and we have a series of papers involving continuous dynamics associated with um, immune system function. So here, you have agents having this sort of theory-based, uh, theory-driven, continuous variable dynamics. It's all declaratively specified in system dynamics, which, which is really good for that. And, um, and then you have a context and a broader set of dynamics, which can be articulated in any number of different ways. Um, system dynamics, or excuse me, well, yes, you could use system dynamics, but you could also use agent-based, people put people in networks of spatial position, or you could have discrete event modeling, and these agents go through the uh, uh, through episodes of care in the healthcare system. So let's let's take a look at this um, with some examples, if we could, and we'll actually um, take a look at uh, two two uh, two examples of this. Um, one of them will be. Uh, human agents and dynamics within them. Another one will be pathogen reservoirs, okay? The idea here is that we might have um, uh, surfaces or um, work areas um, or households that have a certain level of contamination. We saw earlier this for uh, prions. Um, prions might be shed by deer that are infected with chronic wasting disease in a certain you know, patch of land, and we might capture the buildup 
and slow, slow, slow um, flushing of, of prions over decades. Um, here, we're going to have a pathogen that could build up as a result of droplets uh, spawned by infections or fecal oral contamination and I think Norwalk virus and uh, then it may spread within that household and as more individuals get sick they may shed more, right, um, et cetera. So let's go take a look at uh, some examples of each of these. Um, we have uh, some, uh, several models that, that fit into this. Um, okay, so um, here we have, um, uh, okay, one example, um, uh, sort of the prototypical example uh, is this, um, uh, okay, sorry, I need to browse back to this. Still in, okay, let's go close this model so we don't wanna see the Billy Bud model any further. Um, and we will uh, close it. How did I do that? I did file, close all, okay. Um, next, I will go to my browser and I'll go to hybrid, ladies and gentlemen, models. Okay, um, there's a thing called CTL state variable, use any logic seven, okay. Um, some of these names have been um, accreted um, uh, more by accident than anything else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna right click on it and you will see um, a thing called a, you know, an ALP file. If you right click on that and do a download, you sh should be able to download it, okay? Um, okay. Next. Having downloaded it, I'm going to go to AnyLogic. I'm going to open it up from Downloads. Now I actually, so Jeff McDonald kindly lent us some, some pictures at one point, but I, I didn't download those, so we'll have to do without the, the nice photos that, that he had here. Um, but I'd like you to go um, open it. Who needs a bit more time for opening it? Anyone need uh, need need more um, more time? You ready to go forward? Ready to collapse? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So so, ladies and gentlemen, if you got a person, double click on person. What you'll find here is a is a most distressing <laughs> view of life. Um, so uh, this, this model is a kind of, um, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of uh, um, stark view of things. So on the left side, you'll see the life cycle depict where someone is living or they're, they're dead. Um, so there, there's a state of living. And actually, this is important because what happens is people are going to die here from uh, excessively high viremia levels, uh, viral levels that are too high will kill them. And that's why we have this distinction, because when they die, they will be eliminated from the contact networks, okay? Now, over on the right here, you see something that may look um, odd. It, it certainly lacks, um, uh, lacks full finesse um, uh, uh, aesthetically. Um, uh, does anyone recognize, what is this thing? What language is this in? System dynamics, this is a system dynamics model, okay? And you actually have uninfected cells called X, infected cells called Y, there's an infection process between them, and then there's a, 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 pre, a level of free variants, uh, free virus particles in the bloodstream called V, which ends up leading to infection, and uh, cells that are infected end up uh, shedding uh, uh, free, uh, free variants, and hence there's a link from Y, which are infected cells to variant production. So basically this is a published theory which we just uh, adopted from published papers and books, and we stuck it in this, in this model. We actually have a quite articulate model like this for virus, for uh, influenza transmission with a 
uh, that we constructed with a flu immunologist who sadly um, passed away before we could uh, publish it. But um, the similar idea, we have immunological dynamics, including immune memory. Immune memory is actually captured just off the bottom of the screen here with a Z compartment um, uh, down here. Uh, there's a immune memory which basically helps if you've got immune memory built up, it helps kill off uh, infected cells. So this is death by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So this is cell-mediated immunity. And basically, as a person gets infected, cells get infected, virion levels rise, and further the infection process, but the immune system ends up kicking in um, somewhat more slowly and that starts to fight the infection. Eventually, the immune system tends to beat it out for most individuals. But for individuals whose immune system is impaired, for example, elderly, those taking immunosuppressants, uh, et cetera, you may get um, an infection that outruns the immune system um, over the longer term, and you may have uh, very high virion levels and, and death. So here we have this kind of immune system level characterizes stocks and flows within a person, and we have a, a person's um, death, mortality, is dictated by their, their viral load level. So if their viral load level is represented by V here, goes above a fatal threshold, they will die. Okay, so there's a threshold at which they will die. And uh, within this model, um, we, can, um, we can alter that uh, fatal threshold. So if we run, for example, medium uh, vital uh, viral threshold um, here, uh, there are some references to some of the papers. Um, if we run this, um, uh, what we'll see is we uh, will get a uh, a series of infections going on between individuals in the population. Agents here are placed in networks as agents, right? They're connected with other individuals. And the, um, the, the width of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, individuals uh, here, the, the diameter associated or radius, uh, but much so, associated with each person is dictated by their, um, uh, by their immune memory level. You'll notice these individuals have very high immune memory. These naive individuals over here on the right who have yet to be infected have no real immune memory to this pathogen. Um, the redness indicates viral load level. Okay, so we'll see this again. I'll, I'll slow it down this time. Um, I'll slow it down to uh, just its, its uh, one speed here. And what you'll realize is there's a single person here who's uh, infected. And that person develops infection, they develop high viral load levels, and their immune system eventually catches up and it starts to bring it under control. But meanwhile, they've infected people around them. And and those individuals, most of them bring it under control, but they in turn infect people. And some of these individuals, as it turns out, being a heterogeneous population, some of these individuals end up having um, uh, lower capacity to fight off the infection. So if you go to Maine, for example, man, this is an old model, um, uh, and you go to, um, the uh, population of people here. Um, it's in, wow, that's, that's kind of funky. Um, uh, here we have different levels of immune system strength as indicated by a certain key parameter called uh, C um, associated with, with each person. And basically some individuals are able to fight off the infection, others not. And that leads to some individuals dying from the infection because of high viremia levels. By virtue of dying, they, they um, uh, then are disconnected from, the, the network can be disconnected and they end up not spreading it to the broader population. So this is immune system dynamics in response to infection. 
And you may wonder, why in the world would you want to do this? Well, we lay out in a number of articles um, cases for this. Um, and uh, I think the reasons are quite compelling, actually, why in certain circumstances you would want to represent immune system dynamics. One thing is that um, there's a certain number of hypotheses about dynamics of, of epidemiological dynamics in the world that are couched around immunological constructs, that are couched around hypotheses involving what's going on immunologically. For example, Bob Bronham's arrested immunity hypothesis for chlamydia, um, which posits that if you have someone infected by chlamydia and you treat them too soon, you will blunt their development of immune memory uh, to that, and, and immune defenses to that pathogen, throw them back into their sexual networks, for example, and they may get infected again quite quickly. Whereas if there's a bit of time taken before treatment is conferred, they may develop stronger infection, uh, stronger defenses against future infection because of the, the immune system uh, uh, memory is built up. And so the, uh, the idea advanced by Bob Brunham at the time, the head of the BCCDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control, was that um, uh, possibly our, um, our public health mechanisms were being too successful in Canada in treating people quickly and thereby blunting development of immunity. Um, we built some models that questioned that, that suggested it wasn't enough to explain the, the rise in cases we see chlamyd uh, chlamydia-wise um, that, that were uh, someone had attempted to explain with it. Um, another case, um, uh, we, we examined the impacts of vaccinations and um, argued um, per Wade's, some of Wade's modeling that he'll be showing you uh, with, with chicken pox. The idea is that ongoing exposures to disease in as much as they might build up immune memory can actually be valuable to protect one against full-blown infection. And in the event that that um, exposure is eliminated, there's a certain amount of uh, extra work that has to be done by the public health system to protect someone because the immune memory may actually be at a lower level than it would have been otherwise. And what Wade's work does is examines the impacts on shingles um, associated with that boosting effect. So the point is not that you should build this for all cases, far from it. The point is immune dynamics play a role in epidemiological dynamics according to some hypotheses. And tools like these provide good ways of probing those dynamics. So just one example. Um, uh, there's another example I have, which I won't be showing, but I'm glad to show to individuals uh, if they are interested, we don't have time now, that involves um, tolerance levels in opioid exposures. And the idea there is um, opioid levels raise, um, uh, raise tolerance levels. So opioid use raises tolerance levels. To get the same bang, I need more opioids. Um, as my tolerance goes up. And then if I'm cut off from opioids for a while, my tolerance level will decrease over time. And individuals who don't understand those dynamics um, and whose waning of their tolerance uh, is driving craving, they may end up ingesting levels of opioids that are now no longer sustainable and they may overdose uh, because their tolerance has declined so much. They're used to taking a big dose and now they can, that will kill them. Um, and similarly, uh, there's issues with switching to dealer-based opioids from opioids that previously were pharmaceutically produced and very, very well controlled to now opioids that are, that are only episodically available and are um, of uncertain dose. Um, so uh, there's a case to be made there. Another case that um, Chen Yang has done uh, related work to, although we haven't built a model quite like this one yet, is um, um, dynamics of addiction to nicotine and the impacts of e-cigarettes and prolonged exposure in e-cigarettes. As it builds up tolerance levels, it may lead, lead to craving for e-cigarettes and indeed 
for uh, even cigarettes for individuals who use both. Um, so, so those are uh, some uh, additional um, sort of cases where this could be useful. I'm going to close this. Well, any questions about this model before I move on to the pathogen reservoir model? Questions? Question? Okay, so let's close this model. Right, you can right click on it and choose close all um, is an easy way to do it. You can also do close others. So if you have one model open and you have several others also open, you can click on the model you want to keep and then say close others and it will close all the rest. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's now go back to our sample models and we are going to download here uh, a, uh, a model that is called, um, from that same hybrid folder, st st students, please, uh, please be ready for helping those, uh, those in the uh, participant pool. In hybrid models, there's a model called environmental contamination hybrid, okay? I'd like you to double click on that and um, you will, I'd ask you to download that ALP file as well. Okay, this is a model of pathogen reservoirs as they live in certain spatial locations, okay? Um, so we can have buildup of droplets perhaps on a surface or, you know, um, through contamination of, um, uh, and, and uh, limited hygiene available, perhaps following a disaster, we might have um, in, an, in a region, um, uh, contaminated water supplies uh, that are contaminated with uh, cholera, for example, uh, Vibrio cholerae. So I just downloaded uh, environmental contamination hybrid. I'm going to open it in any logic. This should be becoming old hat. Um, who needs TA help? The TAs sit ready, keen to help, or at least willing to help. Okay. Um, okay. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we'll try to go through this a little bit uh, faster. So uh, here I'm going to run up top um, a medium population here, okay? I'm, I'm running a, a scenario. Um, this is a model where we have individuals in home. And uh, we have homes whose size physically is dictated by the size of the family associated with that. All individuals in a family are, are so superimposed, so you don't see them. So I size the homes uh, according to the size of the family. Now, during the day, individuals go to work in these workplaces, okay? Um, and then they come back home. <laughs> and now they're in different organizations. There are different orientations because they went to different workplaces and I didn't tell them to all go in an upright position. So they're kind of a kilter, okay? But what we're seeing here is a day and night cycle. And I would just note that one of the workplaces, each workplace here and each home is associated with, just to its right, is associated with uh, a square. And the redness of the square will indicate contamination level of, the, of a reservoir pathogen that's at that home. This home here in the center started like that of Typhoid Mary, the kitchen of Typhoid Mary, it starts contaminated, okay? And what happens is that individuals in that home got contaminated. But that, it didn't stay in that household because of mobility, personal mobility. So those individuals traveled to their workplaces and brought it to their workplaces. And traveling to their workplaces, others were infected at the workplace who then brought it home to their homes. And by going back and forth between homes and workplaces and, work, and homes, what you see is this successive spread of infection from its original point of origin to individuals. Now, 
What's happening here, though, is not merely pathogen transmission person to person. What's happening is a deposition in the environment to which people are, are exposed in a given environment. Um, and, and so there's this indirect buildup and indeed persistence and memory associated with the infection, okay? So if we were to, to go browse this again, if we go over here, we can go down, for example, to workplaces. You'll notice that each workplace is associated with uh, a reservoir, okay? Um, and you can see here the pathogen reservoir and its dynamics. This pathogen reservoir was infected sometime short of time 100. It is engaged in waxing and waning. Anyone want to guess what's going on with that, with that uptick and then decline and then uptake? So seemingly regular. Day and night, exactly. So if we go and we look at persons in this model, we find they have work time and off time. So they come home during the day uniformly, and they are not at work. And so at work, this is in a workplace um, that I zoomed into, a workplace, the pathogen declines uh, in the evening hours um, as it, you know, dry, the surface is dry, etc. But um, as long as there's a new group of shedding individuals who come in, um, it will build up according to shedding. You'll notice here there's more shedding going on um, uh, by individuals during the day. This is actually driven, this shed pathogen is driven by um, the number of people who are in close proximity who are infected. I can show you that logic. But fundamentally, during the day, if there's individuals are already infected, they shed here. It builds up the pathogen. The pathogen persists overnight, although it, it's declining. And if an individual were to come in who's not infected, they might get it from the pathogen reservoir, even if people around them are not recovered. Okay? Um, so um, here we have a, uh, an evolution of a single factory. Um, there's a similar dynamic in place for homes, okay? We have pathogen reservoirs at homes which build up and which decline as, as uh, um, people recover or people are at work, uh, et cetera. Um, um, so here are people mostly recovered now uh, and yet the pathogen, so people are gray, like ash, they have burnt through the infection, okay? There's a few people here who remain infected, but most people have, have recovered, and, um, and yet the pathogen reservoir remains. So if newly susceptible people were to come in here, they could uh, become infected. And up large, uh, up, up above you can see kind of work-based pathogens and home pathogens totaled up across the population. Here's an individual. We have people susceptible, uh, shedding, and recovered. And you can only imagine, and I will leave it as an exercise to the reader, maybe one will undertake tomorrow, um, to, uh, to then examine the effects of, of uh, waning of immunity. What do you think would happen if, if uh, immunity waned here? Um, we have people going back and forth, home and work, and suppose immunity were to wane. What, what do you think would, uh, uh, would happen in that case? How would it change the dynamics? Well, let me ask this. If I were to run this full tilt as fast as I could for hours and hours, what do you think is going to happen here? What's the end point of this model? Anyone want to pause it? Everyone's recovered now. There's no chance for a recovered individual. Once recovered, there's no chance they'll become infected again. What do you think's the logical consequence of this theory as to, far, as to how the model um, end state will end up? Eventually, everyone will be recovered, and what do you think the reservoir levels will be? They'll go to zero because no one's shedding anymore. 
So eventually, they will don't persist for a while, but they can't affect anyone. So there's no new shedders that are going to come in. And so it'll decline and decline and decline. There's no new shedding going on to build it up. The outflow is greater than the inflow. There's no inflow. There's big outflow. So over time, the situation sorts itself out. Hmm? Hmm? What do you think would happen now if we were to put in a loss of immunity? Let's suppose from recovered they could go back to susceptible. Should we try it? Okay, let's let's try it. Let's pull up those sleeves. Let's let's try our hands at this. Um, get out the out that late afternoon doldrums. Okay, so I'm going to go to view and I'm going to do palette. Okay, there we go. Palette, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, TAs prepared to deploy. Um, this this is okay. Now now we're now we're in the big time. Um, okay, so I did palette and I'm going to go to this agent palette. The palette has many different features of it. Um, uh, many of them are of less uh, direct health relevance, but um, um, one of them of persistent relevance is this one here. It's called the agent palette, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, don't mind this little thing, which is <laughs> silly. Um, okay, so I went to the agent palette, and I'm going to drag a transition in here from recovered back to susceptible, okay? So I'm going to articulate a theory now that people can go from a recovered state where they're immune to a susceptible state. How did I do that? Well, I want to draw attention to a few things. What I did at the most basic level is I dragged from this agent palette, that's this measure of man, Da Vincian emblem, I dragged over a transition, and I stuck one side of it onto recovery. You notice it turns green. Green is the color, and state charts are the game. Um, okay, so this is green here, um, and that means it's connected. It knows that it's, it's going to be coming from recovery. Whither, ladies and gentlemen, where will that go? Well, let's Let's go drag it. Here we're going to drag this side to susceptible, okay? Um, and make sure it's green. Green um, as that uh, susceptible thing is, okay? That will indicate it's connected in both ways. But what that secures by functionality, it loses by aesthetics. So I would like to bend this to our will. Because aesthetically, it is it is it distresses even I. Okay, so um, the way in which you can bend these things, it doesn't change the function, it doesn't change the underlying mathematics of it, the underlying logic, but it, it can lead to a world of uh, improvement in performance and ability to convey things to stakeholders. If you double click on it, you'll find a little what's called a handle. And I like to put two handles in, um, and uh, we will drag it up like that, okay? Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, better than it was, certainly. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll drag this around so it will go more neatly there, okay? And I could quibble about it, but here is our transition out. Okay, um, and this is a timeout transition. So it's after a certain amount of time. Um, and for ease of specifying it, we will we will specify a um, hundred time units. Okay, um, you'll notice that um, the model is going to have a time unit associated with it. So if you, I'll just go show you, you don't have to do this, but if you go to the model, it says the time unit is, is, um, uh, is hours, okay? 
So I'll say that um, there's a, a timeout of, uh, uh, let's say 200 hours, okay? Um, uh, 200 hours here. Say 250, 250, that's better. Uh, 240, 10 days. 10 days you lose your immunity. There we go. Sorry, folks. Um, okay, 240. So after 240 days of recovery, they will then be susceptible again. Okay? They'll be, by virtue of being susceptible, they will be subject to infection. Do you think that will change the dynamics of this model at all? Will you see that change immediately? Not so likely immediately. When will you start to see it? Well, if you run it for long enough, and I'll, I'll run this here. You don't have to run it. Um, by the way, you notice it's, it's hitched up on both sides. It's a timeout transition. That's what this is, was the by default. And I set the timeout by clicking on this. I set the timeout to be 240 hours. This was already filled in. Um, I will run it. You won't see this change immediately because no one's recovered immediately. Um, it takes a certain amount of time for people to get through. Oh man, look at that. Look at that thing. Let me hide the palette again. Um, here we go. I'm gonna run this flat out. There we go. Okay, and I will turn on time here. There we go. Okay, here's this one house that has the infection initially. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, so, so far, there's just a few infectives there. Time is going on, 45, okay. Um, the infection is spreading, ladies and gentlemen. If we look above, what we see is a distressing sight. The amount of workplace pathogen and the amount of uh, um, uh, pathogen in, at home are both uh, quite high still. Okay, now we have a situation of very, very high levels of infection. There's a few people uninfected, those lucky green ones, but, but soon even they will fall prey to the Grim Reaper's um, sigh. Um, and, and even they get infected, as you see now, okay? Is anyone recovered yet? No one's recovered, no one's that gray color that, that uh, indicates recovery. Um, time marches on. Okay, everyone is, is now in this highly infected state, and, um, and yet no one is, is recovered. This highly infected state, is it fair to say because they're infected, these dynamics don't matter? What is still changing? Even if the entire population is infected, what's still changing? Pathogen levels in the reservoirs are still being shed. They still rise in their inexorable way. The hideous logic continues. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, time is moving on. You'll notice the pathogens are engaged in a, a sort of uh, cresting behavior, which suggests that, that um, uh, there's limits. And, and what are you starting to notice? Why is it that they're starting to decline? You know, more and more people are non-shedding, right? And the outflow is greater than the inflow. There's less and less inflow from shedders, and there's more and more of these pathogen rembrandts unsupported by individual shedding into them. Yeah. The, the pathogen levels are dropping quickly, and, and uh, by and large, people are in recovery mode. Ladies and gentlemen, are we out of the woods yet? What risk lies before us yet? Yeah, people are going to start losing immunity here, ladies and gentlemen. Not for some time. Not for some time. What risk is losing immunity? If they become susceptible, everyone else is recovered. Why, why is there anything to fear? Anyone? Why is there anything to fear? Everyone else is recovered. And if they lose immunity, why, why do they have anything to fear? Pathogen reservoirs persist, even yet. Long after the population has recovered, we still see some pathogen remaining. Small amounts, yes, but 
but remaining nonetheless. Time moves on, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're at 416. What, what is the critical thing we're waiting for? Yeah, um, there's, this, there's this time of when are people starting to become susceptible to that? And it will happen as the, ah, ah, oh, did you see that? What did you see? Green and red. Green and red. And it ain't Christmas. Um, it's, it's, it's a, so, we're some, so now what's happening again? And they're getting infected again. Everyone around them was recovered. There was not a single infected person to be seen. The pathogen reservoirs were quite low levels, but they were high enough to pose that risk of infection that now with susceptible people circulating, it all takes off again. And you'll notice it headed on a dangerously rapid up, upwards course, right? Um, uh, and you know, it's an interesting question. Will this exactly duplicate the original dynamics, or will it uh, be different? Um, uh, I will leave that as a homework exercise. But what we've just seen is significant. We just modified a model. We added a transition. Um, and you know, thinking about that, um, we changed the theory. And we see what's the consequence of this new theory. You know, if we saw the ability to lose immunity, what would it mean for the dynamics of pathogen? And we actually uh, see that writ large here. We see, see the model now projecting out the consequence of this new theory, right? Um, uh, and, and we can test our reasoning about it. For example, will it go higher or will it go lower than the original one um, is an interesting, uh, interesting question. Uh, Another thing we noticed is we added only one little thing and it actually profoundly changed the dynamics. One little transition, one stinking transition, right? Back, back to from recovered to susceptible made, made all the world of difference. Uh, and and it, it fundamentally alters the dynamics in a big way. Changes it from pathogen extinction to pathogen persistence. Um, and uh, you know, continued very high, high uh, load associated with it. Um, we saw that we could have the environment, not just people to people transmission, but the environment as mediated transmission. And we saw that we could, without undue worries, within any logic, declaratively, we could go drag a, a little transition from recovered back to susceptible. Um, and describe uh, an average uh, time to leave uh, to recover of, of 250 days. And we could do so with, in that case, you know, absolutely minimal uh, programming. We were really specifying a constant associated with it. And we engaged in some niceties, some prettifying um, aesthetically. Um, a thoughtful model, ladies and gentlemen. Pathogen reservoirs dynamics of the world around us affecting us and affected by us are a big feature of a lot of situations. Whether it's, um, you know, whether it's air, air pollution and contamination or fecal oral contamination in Norwalk virus in a hospital, um, whether it's prion-based disease and spread of misfolded proteins in deer population, uh, or whether it's um, aspects of uh, of, of adverse uh, social interaction shaping things around us and then being shaped by us. We often have the duality between, you know, we build our buildings and then our buildings build, build us, as Winston Churchill said. Um, so uh, whether it's knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, or pathogen like here, these models that capture interactions between the environment and some environmental quantities like uh, reservoir and and the, the health status of individuals are important. And that is something indeed enabled, like like for the others, by this uh, uh, by this uh, notion of stocks and flows within agents. Here are the stocks and flows were within these environmental reservoirs. Um, we have some models also pursuing this for uh, things like mosquito populations. 
such as simulated by none other than the, uh, by Chen Yang. Um, uh, this was a model built by Wen Yi An back in the day for mosquito populations in a geographic area for different patches of land where a similar mosquito model uh, took place um, and, and simulated mosquito populations who could then move between different areas. Okay, we're, we're reaching the final two of ours, but any questions about those we've just seen? Any questions about the hybrid models we've, we've just looked at? Huh? Okay. Um, I'd like to now talk about a third, excuse me, fourth um, uh, notable pattern in um, health hybrid modeling. And here we have agents driving um, aggregate system dynamics, okay? Um, for example, um, consider this for a model with uh, health economics. And we have uh, agents driving accumulations of qualities, of quality adjusted life years across the population, or driving um, environmental contaminants for the model as a whole, not just for localized agents, um, or cost levels. Um, we, we build these a lot, not always explicitly with the system dynamics model, but, um, uh, but in ways that uh, mathematically uh, approximate it. So to see this, I'm going to ask you to close the model we just built, recognizing that for any of these models, you could always do file recently open models and open them. And I'd like you to next open here a model, or sorry, go, go uh, find a model on the site that's called um, here, okay, right. Um, uh, so there's a model which is um, basic health economics ABM. Okay, if you go click on that, you will find, <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to suggest that you, you get the basic health economics ABM, any logic seven, refactored. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not quite sure. I believe it's refactored, but um, uh, but uh, you know, I, I'm not going to blow against the wind with that. So it's uh, we'll get this refactored model, and um, we will go having downloaded it. Um, we can go open it in any logic. Okay. Okay. Now. This model um, uh, is one that illustrates uh, the type of example I just mentioned, one in a health, uh, a health economics context. So the idea here is that we have persons, and these persons go between different states. I have a much more sophisticated version of this that we built in Melbourne in um, 2015 November, um, the first of two back-to-back uh, -back boot camps um, um, that, that involves multiple conditions. If anyone's interested, we take into account uh, comorbidities in cost and quality of life uh, outcomes. Here we have a diabetic progression um, um, type of uh, model. We have progression between uh, stages of diabetes according to hazard rates, and we have individuals in any of these stages being subject to mortality effects, um, either due to diabetes, diabetes complications, or due to um, other, other uh, uh, concerns. Um, now, each of these people is placed into a population um, that in involves many people, and we accumulate across the population um, a number of quantities. Undiscounted costs, uh, discounted costs, life years, and quality adjusted life years. Well, the quality adjusted life years take into account the uh, differential quality of life at different stages of diabetes and complications. 
and they're generally lower in quality of life as complications develop, particularly with need for dialysis, et cetera. So these, uh, these are stocks and flows. And when you see a stock, mind, mind this, students, mind this, TAs. Uh, when you see a stock with a flow into it alone, this stock is at a mathematical level, for those who are whom this is a meaningful term, this is an integral of this flow. All this does is accumulate this flow, right? Now, all it does is total it up over time. It's like you have a bathtub, or better yet, a swimming pool, and you turn on a spigot of five liters per minute. And over time, that swimming pool, slowly but surely, will accumulate that water, right? Um, uh, five liters uh, per minute in the first you know, 100 minutes, you'll get 500 liters of water accumulated. It will just continue on. And so it is with these stocks. So life years live starts at zero. And it accumulates life years as they are experienced by the population. Quality adjusted life years accumulates quality weighted life years, quality of life, health related quality of life uh, weighted uh, life years as they are experienced by the population. And so it is with discounted costs and undiscounted costs. We add costs in, uh, both costs associated with uh, uh, a sort of uh, a uh, Costs associated with events and, and with states that people are in, um, as well as um, uh, intervention costs. Um, so here we have um, uh, costs accumulating in this undiscounted uh, cost area, and we have a similar discounting factor that um, uh, that is according to a discount rate, uh, which I think is three percent. Um, so the idea here is we use system dynamics to kind of total up these quantities across the whole population. And recognizing the flows in here are not fixed. They're not, they're not fixed quantities. For example, this flow into life years is just the population size. So if we have uh, you know, 1,000 people in the population, um, they accumulate 1,000 new life years per, per year lived. And indeed, the uh, the time unit of this model is years, okay? So over the course of a year, uh, a 1,000 people will accumulate, oh, model, time units, uh, mumble. Um, uh, mumble, um, okay, uh, that should have said years. I'm, I'm not, not quite sure why that said um, minutes. Um, <laughs> okay, in any case, um, uh, these things uh, flow in here and um, and they accumulate. And so conceptually what's going on is that we have a accumulation. Oh, okay, now, now we're in trouble. It looks like the refected model. Um, okay, um, uh, I may have told you to, to, uh, to download the, uh, the wrong model here. Let me, uh, let me look at this. Uh, okay, um, okay, this is, this is great. Um, uh, okay, only in um constants can be used. Oh, I know. It's because, okay, this is with an old version of any logic. Um, <laughs> it needs to be refacted. Um, okay, I, I won't try to run this. Uh, this is unfortunately for an old version of any logic. I believe there may be a new one that's on there for any, that's suitable for any logic eight because uh, this was redone a year or two ag ago for any logic eight. I'll just quickly check, and if so, I'll ask you to download that one. Sorry, I shouldn't have chosen the refected one. Um, here we go, um, and uh, I'll just see if this other one is any better off. Let's let's give it a shot. Boom. Um, this looks a little bit. Yes, this one is better. Okay, sorry, folks. I I have erred. Mea culpa. Um, we should have gone and downloaded the non-refected one. <laughs> the, the refecting was uh, adverse. Um, um, maybe, maybe it stands for infected. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, if you download this other and then you go open it in any logic instead, close that other one, 
by doing close all before you open it and then open the new one and um, and you should be a happy camper um, okay um, so what's happening here is that we have accumulations going on across the model these accumulations do take into account amongst other things uh, quality of life of the population and quality of life is affected by um, people's uh, state here so uh, each of these states assigns a different quality of life so for example end-stage renal disease assigns a quality of life and assigns um, uh, a cost per year used in the activity-based costing okay and we have an accumulation in the model as a whole associated with these values from from the various agents. And so here we're using system dynamics at a higher level to total things up. And this is not uncommon. Sometimes we use system dynamics for broader environmental things like you know, weather patterns or um, environmental, uh, ambient environmental trends, uh, seasonality components, et cetera. Um, uh, we'll have a system dynamics model that ends up affecting the agents. Okay. So this is another modeling pattern, system dynamics at a high level, agents at a low level. And finally, I will um, uh, close that model um, and uh, we'll go to this one. Um, right. Um, oh, I should, I should mention there's also, uh, there's this interesting case where we use agents I, I wasn't articulating it like this, but sometimes you can have a general population, for example, that's articulated at an at a, um, aggregate level of people, and then you have an Asian population, let's say associated with um, non-governmental organizations, community organizations, or companies, or some combination of those competing. Um, that are affecting the general population. So here the general population is not characterized at an individual level. It's characterized at an aggregate level. But we have these um, adverse and pro-social actors that are affecting the development of risk factors. Maybe these are soft drink companies, right? Or, or um, big, big pharma uh, pushing, pushing pharmaceuticals. Or maybe it's um, you know, big, uh, big um, ag pushing uh, certain um, uh, you know, products to, uh, to sell uh, highly processed foods. And we have the general population that's subjected to this. And here our focus might be on regulation of the companies, but we're interested in understanding how, how does it affect the general population. Um, and uh, here we can you know, focus again on an area of the model while still capturing effects to the broader population, um, and um, and it supports um, you know some some nice uh, characterizations of dynamics at that high level. Um, right. Um, the final thing is I'll just say aggregate system dynamics uh, uh, drive agent population. So an example of this. Um, and I don't actually think um, I'll, I'll show you one here for this, but um, this would be like using Chen Yang's model of uh, mosquito dynamics. Um, here we have susceptible, exposed, and infected mosquitoes. This is actually a generalization of Chen Yang's model to include um, not just mosquito uh, demography, but mosquito infections. And individuals, um, or sorry, and, and aggregate population members of mosquitoes can then infect agents in the human population. And so we can get agents, particularly those that with immunoweakening conditions, immunocompromised individuals, et cetera, whose uh, health trajectories are adversely affected by, by biting by um, infected mosquitoes. So here we can have environmental dynamics at an aggregate level affecting, uh, affecting agents. And I, I talked about this before. Okay. Um, okay, so I mentioned a number of, of these um, components um, 
And uh, I think I'll leave it uh, there. I wanted to get a case study in for this, af uh, for this afternoon. And um, uh, I think I'll answer any questions about this and then we'll transition as time allows to one or even two case studies, recognizing that if we can't hit the second case study today, we can do so uh, when you're fresh uh, in the morning, okay? So any questions about these hybrid modeling types that have been presenting, these kind of five compelling hybrid modeling patterns? Any questions related to them? No questions? Yes? Yeah, just a previous one, because uh, you have two kind of costs. Uh, right. Discount, you know, this kind of right. So those kind of uh, interventions, well, what are the difference? Well, um, so, you know, uh, different um, health uh, economists or, or, or clients of health economists will often um, seek on different measures of cost effectiveness. And discounts and costs are the most commonly used measures in, in, um, in um, intervention cost effectiveness, as, as I understand it. So you might have you know, um, incremental discounted uh, costs per you know, change in incremental discounted costs per change in, in uh, qualities um, accumulated, which would be you know, extra dollars, discounted dollars per quality adjusted life you're saved, for example. Um, but there are times where I've seen similar studies end up using, and, and probably it's driven sometimes by stakeholders, undiscounted costs. So where we don't discount costs that are born further into the future. Um, and. Um, those, uh, those are presented as an alternative way of, of totaling up you know, the costs over the, uh, the life cycle of an intervention or broader into the future in a way that isn't subject to discounting. Discounting of qualities I found to be contentious in some areas. People ask, you know, you know is it proper to discount you know, the the quality adjusted life years of our children, you know, um, and grandchildren, um, you know, and, and count them as, as worth less than, um, than today. I've heard some people get uh, quite, uh, you know, strongly opinionated to the no on that, and I've heard others say that uh, it follows logically from, from discounting the cost side as well. And I'm not an expert in this area, but what I've seen is that um, different, um, different uh, audiences sometimes would prefer the discounted quantities and some prefer the discounted ones. So I included those um, uh, as examples of how those could be um, computed. Um, at a technical level, computing either is straightforward. Um, but you can't just accumulate one and then produce the other directly from it. You have to accumulate them um, over time. Um, to get summary measures of, of both, okay? And um, I'd be glad to explain in more technical detail if there's, if there's interest in doing so. But we use the stocks and flows for it, okay? Um, other questions we could address? Questions? Okay, so um, if there's no more questions, I think what we'll do is we'll break for a couple minutes while a wave sets up for a case study, and then as time allows, we may further have, uh, be fortunate to have Young um, present uh, a case study of a uh, multi-scale hybrid model. Um, but uh, we'll see how the, uh, the time goes, and, uh, and we'll, we'll deal with um, as many questions as people would like to bring forward. Okay, so uh, we'll break for uh, five to 10 minutes now while we get uh, Wade all set up. Thanks very much, and see you in just a few here.